Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today we'll continue our conversation about Edward Said's Orientalism, Introduction, Part 3. And I will start from page 15, bottom of the page, and then end today's conversation on page 19. Uh, now, this is the second point in Part 3 that Said is trying to explain. Now remember, what he has said is that he de he had to deal with three aspects of the reality as a scholar in which he existed. In the previous lecture, which you can watch up there, we talked about his explanation of the difference between pure knowledge and scientific knowledge and how that distinction is maintained in humanities and how he needed to explain that because his work, Orientalism, transgresses those kind of definitions. Now the second section in part three is called the methodological question. And in this section, he is going to explain various aspects of the method that he has employed in this book. Of course, part of the reason also is that that is one ground upon which he can be criticized and attacked. So he starts the discussion by basically, first of all, explaining why does he choose a certain point in history to start his study of Orientalism, right? The question of beginning. And then in the later part, he tries to then explain as to why he is focusing mostly on French, uh, American, and British works, and within that certain specific works, and why not the German Orientalist works. And that's part of his explanation in terms of his method. Now, as a scholar, I mean, other than the rich materials included in, these included in these discussions, what we also can learn with our own work is that these questions are the questions that we ourselves need to pose to our own work, especially if we are doing any kind of scholarly work that engages in the larger superstructural debates of how things are done. I just realized I just finished my manuscript for my next forthcoming book. I just finished revising it, and this very question of inclusion, why I have I included certain texts, was a big question, even on my mind. And of course, I don't think I, myself that I work on that level as Edward Said, but that this methodological question is crucial. So as I've done before, I'll read parts of the text and then come back and we'll talk about it. So here I go, I'm going to read the first couple of passages and then come back to talk about it. In a previous book, I gave a good deal of thought and analysis to the methodological importance for work in the human sciences of finding and formulating a first step, a point of departure, a beginning principle. A major lesson I learned and tried to present was that there is no such thing as a merely given or simply available starting point. Beginnings have to be made for each project in such a way as to enable what follows for them. Nowhere in my experience has the difficulty of this lesson been more consciously lived. With what success or failure I cannot really say than in this study of Orientalism. The idea of beginning, indeed, the act of beginning necessarily involves an act of delimitation, limit, de by which something is cut out of a great mass of material, separated from the mass, and made to stand for, as well as be, a starting point, a beginning. For the student of text, one such notion of inaugural delimitation is Louis Althusser's idea of the problematic a specific determinate unity of a text or group of texts which is something given rise to by analysis. Yet in the case of Orientalism, as opposed to the case of Marxist texts, which is what Althusser studies, there is not simply the problem of finding a point of departure or problematic, but also the question of designated, designating which texts, authors, and periods are the one best suited for study. So from the very start, the first question he's trying to answer is the question of beginning in terms of the method. And he starts with a reference to one of his 
other books and that's the book right beginning intentions and method this is the book in which said philosophically tries to answer the question of beginning itself right and here i will read the first beginning lines of the book the problem of beginning is one of those problems that if allowed to will con will confront one with equal intensity on a practical and on a theoretical level every writer knows that the choice of a beginning for what he will write is crucial not only because it determines much of what what follows but also because a work's beginning is practically speaking the main entrance to what it offers so the question of beginning is crucial right so in order to explain the existential and philosophical reality within which he is writing the book he must then invoke the question of beginning where is he starting the beginning of orientalism and why right he also refers to in this paragraph to althusser right and the question of the problematic now that comes from althusser's reading of marx right and with while reading and the book is called for marx right while reading that althusser theorizes the question of the problematic and i'm going to kind of just read what it means now a world or concept cannot be considered in isolation it only exists in the theoretical or ideological framework in which it is used it's problematic right so said is saying is that what i'm trying to explain to you is kind of akin to louis althusser's idea of the problematic because when he is reading marx and his text he can't just read it half hazardly he has to figure out what is the central problematic that he is trying to invoke and then apply to marx text but said's case is slightly more complex right said is not dealing with the oeuvre of one author right said is dealing with a list of writers historians poets also they come from different imperial nations right so there are writers from britain there are writers from france united states right and then there is has to be so the question is like those of you who write social science dissertations the question of delimitation how do you delimit your inquiry what are you excluding and why what are you including and why that's exactly the same question that he is trying to answer first of all on the level of the process right what is the problematic that he is dealing with of orientalism how is he claiming its beginning that i'm going to start from here because it's not natural right but it decides what will be included right what would be considered part of the entire oeuvre that he's going to be dealing with right and then the question of who is included for him the question is not just of temporality but also of the expansiveness of the orientalist production and he is going to go on to explain to us as to why he is privileging the french the british and american orientalists and why his work suffers from this weakness that he is not including in it the german ideologists the german idealists who were also orientalists so that is what he is trying to explain here i just wanted to take a few moments to explain why is he talking about his book beginning in intentions and the question of the problematic as used by louis althusser so let's go on and read a little more and i'll come back it seemed to me foolish to attempt an encyclopedic narrative history of orientalism first of all because if my guiding principle was to be the european idea of the orient there would be virtually no limit to the material i would have had to deal with second because the narrative model itself did not suit my descriptive and political interests third because in such books as raymond schwab's la renaissance orientale john fuchs die arabian studies in europe 
uh, I can't read it in German. And more recently, Dorothy Mitzig's The Matter of Araby in Medieval England, there already exist encyclopedic works on certain aspects of the European Oriental encounter, such as make the critic's job in the general political and intellectual context I sketched above a different one. There still remained the problem of cutting down a very fat archive to manageable dimensions, and more important, outlining something in the nature of an intellectual order within that group of texts without at the same time following a mindlessly chronological order. My starting point, therefore, has been the British, French, and American experience of the Orient taken as a unit. What made that experience possible by way of historical and intellectual background, what the quality and character of the experience has been, for reasons I shall discuss presently, I limited that already limited but still inordinately large set of questions to the Anglo-French-American experience of the Arabs and Islam, which for almost a thousand years together stood for the Orient. Immediately upon doing that, a large part of the Orient seemed to have been eliminated. India, Japan, China, and other sections of the Far East. Not because these regions are not important, they obviously have been, but because one could discuss Europe's experience of the Near Orient or of Islam apart from its experience of the Far Orient. Yet, at certain moments of that general European history of interest in the East, Particular parts of the Orient, like Egypt, Syria, and Arabia, cannot be discussed with also without also studying Europe's involvement in the more distant parts, of which Persia and India are the most important. A notable case in point is the connection between Egypt and India, so far as 18th and 19th century Britain was concerned. Similarly, the French role in deciphering the Zend Avesta, the preeminence of Paris as a career center of Sanskrit studies during the first decade of the 19th century. The fact that Napoleon's interest in the Orient was contingent upon his sense of the British role in India. All these Far Eastern interests directly influenced French interest in the Near East, Islam, and the Arabs. So notwithstanding my terrible attempt at pronouncing the German and French names. In this section also, what I just read, he is clearly declaring to us that I am going to study the French, the British, and the American archive. And even that, what he's saying is, I am staying closely with the areas with, where they deal with the with the mid, what we now call the Middle East, the Near East, which is the Islamic Orient, and not necessarily with the Far East, like China and Japan and those regions, right? But he's creating space for bringing in something outside of the region. So uh, when he talks about the first French uh, translation of Zenda Vista, right, uh, in 1777, I think, and so that's a Zoroastrian sacred text, right? So that comes from Iran. So obviously that has had an influence on French Orientalism, right? Then also France was a very large center of Sanskrit studies, which is based in India and not in the Arab world, so hence that is connected to the French Orientalism. And of course, Napoleon's interest in the Near East, right, in the Middle East was partially connected to British interests in India. So if you look at the history of British India, I mean, Napole Napoleon's advisors were actually advising Tipu Sultan in his fight against the British uh, East India Company. So what he's saying is even though I'm excluding Persia and I'm excluding India and those parts from my immediate study of Orientalism, it will figure here or there in that because, because of the colonial interests they are interconnected. But the geographic area of Orientalist representations that he's concerned about is what we now call the Middle East, right? And within that, the Islamic Orient and how he, it has been seen and how it has been represented. So this is the part that he's clarifying in this part of 
the introduction. Remember, this is his explanation of his method. He has first tried to explain why does he start where he starts. Now he's trying to explain why is he delimiting it to a certain specific geographic area. Also, what he's trying to avoid is giving us an encyclopedia or a chronological order of events or writings, which he said other writers have already done extensively. They have collected and they have made compendia and all these things out of it. But he is seeing his role as a critic and not as compiler of resources. So all that he's trying to explain here is his selection, right? His methodological selection of the texts of the time frame, temporality, and spatiality, which areas does he include in the Orient, and, and, and upon which Orientalist discourse has some influence. So primarily, the Near East, the Islamic East, right, which now we call the Middle East. So slowly, as a scholar, he is defining the temporality of what he's going to study but also speciality of it, right? And which particular imperial powers and their cultural production, and within that, not all the texts, but certain specific texts. So that's, in my opinion, that is brilliantly done. And uh, what is unfortunate is that a lot of people who criticize Said for not ex including this or for delimiting things wrongly, absolutely, it seems, do not read his introduction, right? Uh, in the previous part, in part one, I had pointed out that people often deride Said for not giving a voice to the natives. And he's clearly stating in the introduction himself that I know that the physical Orient existed, that they have their lived experiences and their voice, but that is not my project. My project is the construction of Orient within a discourse called Orientalism. So that's why it's very important to read Said carefully, right? So I will move on and read the next part and then come back and we'll talk about it. Britain and France dominated the Eastern Mediterranean from about the end of the 17th century on. Yet my discussion of that domination and systemic interest does not do justice to a. The important contribution to Orientalism of Germany, Italy, Russia, Spain, and Portugal, and b the fact that one of the important impulses towards the study of the Orient in 18th century was the revolution in biblical studies, stimulated by such variously interesting pioneers as Bishop, Loth, Eichhorn, Herder, and Michaelis. In the first place, I had to focus rig rigorously upon the British, French, and later the American material because it seemed inescapably true not only that Britain and France were the pioneer nations in the Orient and in the Oriental studies, but that these vanguard positions were held by virtue of the two greatest political networks in pre-20th century history. The American Oriental position since World War II has fit, I think, quite self-consciously in the places excavated by the two earlier European powers. Then, too, I believe that the sheer quality, consistency, and mass of British, French, and American writing on the Orient lifts it above the doubtless crucial work done in Germany, Italy, Russia, and elsewhere. But I think it is also true that the major steps in Oriental scholarships were first taken in either Britain and France, then elaborated upon by Germans. Sylvester de Sacy, for example, was not only the first modern and institutional European Orientalist who worked on Islam, Arabic literature, the Druze religion, and Sassanite Persia, he was also the teacher of Champollain and of Franz Bopp, the founder of German comparative linguistics. A similar claim of priority and subsequent preeminence can be made for William Jones and Edward William Lane. In the second place, and here the failings of my study of Orientalism are made are amply made up for, there has been some important recent work on the background in biblical scholarship to the rise of what I have called modern Orientalism. The best and the most illuminating relevant is 
E.S. Schaefer's impressive Kubla Khan and the Fall of Jerusalem, an indispensable study of the origins of Romanticism and of the intellectual activity underpinning a great deal of what goes on in Coleridge, Browning, and George Eliot. To some degree, Schaefer's work refines upon the outlines provided in Schwab by articulating the material of relevance to be found in the German biblical scholars and using that material to read in an intelligent and always interesting way the work of three major British writers. Yet what is missing in the book is some sense of the political as well as ideo ideological edge given the oriental materials by the British and French writers I'm principally concerned with. In addition, unlike Schaefer, I attempt to elucidate subsequent developments in academic as well as literary Orientalism that bear on the connection between British and French Orientalism on the one hand and the rise of an explicitly colonial-minded imperialism on the other. Then too, I wish to show how all these earlier matters are reproduced more or less in American Orientalism after the Second World War. So once again in these passages we are still getting the justification of his privileging the French, Britain and then eventually American scholars in his discussion of Orientalism and what comes across very clearly he's kind of filing following the lineage of Orientalist scholarship and what he's saying is that look the Germans might have produced a lot of idealistic romantic works after all, Goethe writes the East-West Divan, right? But they were originally influenced by the French and British authors. That's what he's trying to claim here. For example, when he mentions uh, the works of uh, de Sacy, right? Uh, Sylvester de Sacy, who was a French scholar. Now, his students were French, Champollion, right? And Franz Bach who is a linguist, who is a German, is also his student. So in that sense then, French and British scholars were the one who, according to Said, were the ones who started the so-called field of Orientalism and then when it goes to Germany, it develops there as well. And he will give you another distinction also later when we read about the difference between the German and British and French Orientalists. Then he men mentions the works uh, of uh, what he says that, that a lot of studies have been done. For example, he uh, mentions Eleanor Schaeffer's Kubla Khan and the Fall of Jerusalem, which I think was published in 1975. And she is the one who gives the philosophical and religious kind of history of these important, you know, writers. But what's missing, what he says is in her writing is an accounting of the empire and the politics. And that's why Said is saying is that my omission of Germans is okay, but maybe by focusing on what these major works miss like Raymond uh, Schwab, who also is mentioned here. And Said has a beautiful essay on him. I do strongly urge you to read it. It is called Raymond Schwab and the Romance of Ideas, uh, published in 1976, Daedalus, Volume 105, Number 1. But Schwab is the one who wrote the history of Oriental Renaissance, right? And what he's saying is um, that in terms of what eventually develops into full-blooded Orientalism, the work of the French and British authors, and later the quality and the quantity produced by American Orientalists is overwhelming, and hence it further supports his methodology. He goes on to say that in one part of the book, you know, he first deals with the French and the, uh, and the British texts and materials, and then goes on to prove how they prefigure prominently within the American Orientalist production, just as America post Second World War take over, takes over the political vacuum of empires created by the fall of British Empire and withdrawal of France from most of its colonies. Similarly, 
Orientalism in a different vein is then reproduced in America, even though he will say later that the American Arabist or scholars on the Middle East don't think of themselves as Orientalists or don't call themselves Orientalists. So still, in these passages, since he is explaining his method, he is at that point where he's trying to distinguish as to why is he focusing on British, French, and American texts, and why has he left out the German text and the German Orientalists. And we will go on, read a little more. We have, uh, we're going to finish at page 19, and I think we are now on page 18. So just a little more left. Stay with me. Don't get bored. And uh, I'll be back after I read the next part. Nevertheless, there is a possibly misleading aspect to my study, where, aside from an occasional reference, I do not exhaustively discuss the Ger German developments after the inaugural period dominated by Sesi. Any work that seeks to provide an understanding of academic Orientalism and pays little attention to scholars like Stenhal, Mueller, Becker, Goldsheiser, Brockman, Noldek, to mention only a handful, needs to be reproached, and I freely reproach myself. I particularly regret not taking more account of the great scientific prestige that accrued to German scholarship by the middle of the 19th century, whose neglect was made into a denunciation of insular British scholars by George Eliot. I have in mind Eliot's unforgettable portrait of Mr. Cosborn in Middlemarch. One reason Cosborn cannot finish his key to all mythologies is, according to his young cousin, Will Ledslaw, that he is unacquainted with German scholarship. For not only has Cosborn chosen a subject as changing as chemistry, new discoveries are constantly making new points of view. He is undertaking a job similar to a refutation of Paracelsus because he is not an Orientalist, you know. Eliot was not wrong in implying that by about 1830, which is when Middlemarch is set, German scholarship had fully attained in Euro its European preeminence. Yet at no time in Ger German scholarship during the first two-thirds of the 19th century could a close partnership have developed between Orientalists and a protracted, sustained national interest in the Orient. There was nothing in Germany to correspond to the Anglo-French presence in India, the Levant, North Africa. Moreover, the German Orient was almost exclusively a scholarly or at least a classical Orient. It was made actual it was made the subject of lyrics, fantasies, and even novels, but it was never actual the way Egypt and Syria were actual for Chateaubriand, Lane, Lamartine, Bertrand, Desirelli, or Nerval. There, there is some significance in the fact that the two most renowned German works on the Orient, Goethe's The West, East-West Divan and Friedrich Schlegel's, and I can't read the German, and, um, <laughs> were based respectively on a Rhine journey and on hours spent in Paris libraries. What German Oriental scholarship did was to refine and elaborate techniques whose application was to texts, myths, ideas, and languages almost literally gathered from the Orient by Imperial Britain and France. So I first of all apologize for my terrible pronunciation of German names. Uh, so the Schlegel work that is mentioned translates as uh, about the language and wisdom of the Indians. It was published in 1808. And it, it's in this part of the introduction, we are still on page 19. Said is still explaining his second realistic uh, thing that he had to consider before writing the book, and that is the question of the method, and he's still trying to explain why he doesn't include the Germans, right? And he starts that, nevertheless, you know, that's the misleading aspect of my study, because other than occasional references, it does not give a lot of credence or a lot of a voice to the German Orientalists, right? He acknowledges that that is a weakness, right? But what he also is suggesting, I mean, in the discussion about the Middlemarch, I mean, that is to highlight this, that even in a fictional work, 
you know, George Eliot could say that this person is not accomplishing his mission because he has not read his German Orientalists, right? But what he's saying is that, first of all, politically, there was nothing corresponding to French and British experience for the Germans. They didn't have an empire. They didn't go and study the colonies, and they didn't go and live there. So their work could have been romantic, could have been ideological, but it wasn't connected to the politics and power of an empire. Hence, maybe it may not have the same kind of significant significance in a work like Orientalism, which is trying to trace the connection between power and knowledge, right? Secondly, what he's saying is that even the best of the German works involved doing research in French and British libraries on the works published, composed, and collected by the French and British Orient Orientalists. And so notwithstanding the vigor and power of German Orientalism, German Orientalism in Said's view still relied on the on-the-ground real scholarship produced, collected, and published by the French and the British Orientalists. After all, there is no corresponding work from Germany you know, that produces those huge volumes of the encyclopedia on Egypt. Only the French did it, and the reason they could do it is because Napoleon took them there. Similarly, the customs and habits of Hindus or Arabs, right, or Egyptians by Edward William Lane was made possible because Lane could go there, study that culture, but also produce that book for the British consumption and imbue it with his own pre-understanding of the Egyptians. So that's the distinction that he's trying to make. But he is acknowledging that in this book, other than slight references to German works here and there, I am, for these reasons that he has already explained and we have talked about it, I am not including the German Orientalists. So I'm going to stop here. We are still on part three of the introduction. Said in this part is explaining his methodology. Part of his methodology is why do I start study of Orientalism where I start, that we covered in the first part of this conversation. Then he goes on to its geographical implications, which areas does he cover and why, even though he's focuses, focusing in on the Orient, on the Middle East or the Near East, sometimes Persia and India would figure in there. And then the last part of what we read today, what he's talking about it, why is it that despite their significance, why is it that he's not relying much on the German Orientalists and their work? And part of his reasons were that they actually weren't part of an empire. They didn't actually go there and record the Orient. Maybe their work derived on the research produced by the British and the French. But by and large, his reason is that he still sees it as a weakness, as a misleading aspect of his work. And He's also incorporating the American Orientalists there because physically, in material terms, America supplants the old empires. And then a lot of work of Orientalist nature was being produced in America and is still being produced in America. And America has viable material, palpable interests in the region. So that's where we are going to stop. Um, I will post the links to the whole series up there. Please do click on them and watch the previous lectures so that you, you are on the same page, literally, as we are. And if you have any questions, please send them my way. Make it into a good conversation. Any suggestions are welcome, to. If you have not subscribed to the channel, channel, now is the time to do that so that you can stay updated. Other than that, I am deeply grateful to you for being a part of this experience, and it really excites me that I can do this and have an audience to talk to, have, a, you know, have people who are interested in such things, and that I can reach a wider audience through this medium. Thank you so much, and as always, I will see you next time, and until then, take care, stay safe, and peace and love.